Okay, looks like we can go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. My name is Kevin Saracino. I am a watershed steward. I'm currently serving through the AmeriCorps program with Chagrin River Watershed Partners. And welcome to this webinar, part of our speaker series called Aquatic Invaders in Our Backyard Ponds. Um, I'm joined today with Mark Warman from Cleveland Metro Parks. He's an Aquatic Invasive Species Project Manager. He's going to talk about a few aquatic invasive species throughout Ohio and their impacts. Uh, there is several waterweed species that are starting to become on the move throughout Ohio. And they're you know threatening our ecosystem's health. They also they also have economic and recreational impacts on how we use our rivers and streams and ponds. He's also going to touch on identification and observations he's had in the field and different response strategies that he's worked on or used in the past. And at the very end, he's also going to talk about some rare aquatic plant species that have been found recently throughout Ohio, which is a little exciting. I'm going to turn it over to Mark and we can go ahead and get started. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you, um, attendees, for setting aside some time. Um, one of the first nice days we've had in a while to learn about aquatic invasive plants in our backyards and wild areas, too. So Mark Warman at Cleveland Metro Parks, and I will share my screen. So, OK. And I'll wait for the light to turn green. OK. So. Um, I work for Cleveland Metro Parks, but this project is funded by um, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, their Division of Wildlife, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The money comes from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and um, we travel all over um, Ohio, any place that drains into Lake Erie, looking for and responding to aquatic invasive plants. I just want to start out by mentioning that there is a great diversity of aquatic plants in the Great Lakes region. Uh, two years ago, the, there was a two-year study that looked at aquatic plants in harbors on Great Lakes cities. So we assisted in Cleveland around the Rock Hall, behind the break wall, Cuyahoga River, and there are at least 30 different species of plants that grow in and around Cleveland in Lake Erie and the Cuyahoga and at least 43 species that we know of um, in this survey area. So I want you to think about these aquatic plants as offering an underwater forest, uh, a habitat to ambush predators like this northern pike. Um, they provide food for reptiles, amphibians, uh, dragonflies, damselflies, waterfowl, ducks really rely on these aquatic plants, food over the winter. Um, so they, they have a lot of benefits. They anchor the soils too. Here's another fish eye view of some lily pads. Uh, these plants, they can give us an idea of what the water quality is like. If you've got a lot of calcium in your water, you may have different plants than if you were in acidic habitat like a bog. So they can tell us something about the water quality. One good thing that a lot of pond owners like is that usually these plants, well, these plants are in competition with algae for nutrients. So if you have a healthy balance of plants, um, sometimes you'll have less algae. And I would argue that these plants are often overlooked. They're called seaweed. Um, people, other park districts, um, even Cleveland Metro Parks for, for a long while, we did not pay as close attention to these aquatic plants. And I think that can make us vulnerable to invasive species if they're introduced. Um, if there's pressure there, we may not be quick to, to understand it or quick to respond. So I think it's important that everybody is familiar a little bit with aquatic plants so you can know what the invaders look like and the ways that they can impact uh, the ways that we like to use water. One way that, uh, here's a picture of a plant that is currently impacting um, the ability to recreate. It would be hard to cast the line to go fishing in this water. This is Pima Tuning Reservoir uh, on the border of Ohio and Pennsylvania. It's a very popular place for fishing, um, swimming. They've got campgrounds too. And the water here is about three feet deep, but it is uh, 
a solid mat of one plant, hydrilla, which is invasive in Ohio. And it's harmful in the way that it costs us a lot of money to manage. So pine tuning is large. It's about 17,000 acres and over 430 acres are scheduled for treatment every year to try to reduce the population and um, get rid of hydrilla in areas around pine tuning. Uh, to the tune of about a quarter of a million dollars annually. So it's it's an expensive endeavor once these plants um, enter a water body that's really important for uh, our economic interests. This is a big um, tourism push and lots of people come and generate revenue for Ohio and Pennsylvania at climate tuning. So we need to keep those marinas and fishing and swimming areas open. Aquatic invasive plants may also alter private property. Here's a picture of a pond in Parma. It's pretty small. The landowner correctly identified hydrilla and called Cleveland Metro Parks. They were very tired of raking the plants out of their pond by hand. Hydrilla is recorded at growing up to an inch a day. So if you imagine all those different stems growing an inch a day, uh, it can be backbreaking work to keep removing an aquatic invasive plant like hydrilla from a pond. And here's another private property in Medina County. The landowner was having trouble launching their canoe. They, the children had trouble fishing. It was a moat of hydrilla, so lots of plant growing in water up to 12 feet deep. So aquatic invasive plants may inhibit our ability to recreate on our water. And you may be able to name some other aquatic invasive plants, some that you may have seen, some that may be on your property or nearby. Phragmites is one that lots of people see driving along the highway. Um, it'll likely be there in Ohio. Yellow floating heart is a plant that's kind of on the move and emerging, like Kevin mentioned earlier. And then hydrilla I've shown you a few images of so far. You can probably name others too. Purple loosestrife. Um, there are maybe 50 or so species that are on the watch list, um, and maybe half of those can be found around Ohio. The effects of aquatic invasive plants, um, I, I kind of highlighted a few of these. They do interfere with recreation. They can obstruct intakes and outflows. So at Pima Tuning, they had hydrilla that was so dense that their outflow structure, the way that they would lower water in the reservoir, especially during the winter, um, it was completely jammed by hydrilla, so they had to hire scuba divers to physically remove uh, hydrilla so they could drain water and do their management activities. These aquatic invasive plants can reduce biodiversity. Here, there's an explosion of curly leaf pondweed in the pictures. It's pretty hard to paddle through, and it does tend to force other species out. Uh, if you're a private landowner or even public, and you look out and see this mess of plants, it can reduce the enjoyment or the aesthetic value. These plants may alter the dissolved oxygen and especially they can affect the sunlight too that gets to the bottom of the water. And like I said before, they can be pretty expensive to manage. So I have used the term invasive species a few times now and I just want to reiterate that invasive species that I'm talking about um, are non-indigenous, so they're not native to this to the, the area in question, and they are harmful in some way. They cost us money, they're expensive to manage, they may reduce biodiversity or harm the ecosystem in some other way, and they may harm human health. And you might be thinking, well, how do these, how does curly leaf pondweed affect my health as a human on a boardwalk? And maybe an indirect connection, or you can follow the line to if these plants create a really great habitat for mosquitoes and there are more mosquitoes. We may have um, more mosquito-borne illness, or um, you just might get more mosquito bites, and nobody likes that. So um, I want to tell you about Cleveland Metro Park's involvement with aquatic invasive species, uh, specifically hydrilla, is what kicked our program into um, high gear. We identified hydrilla in 2012 here at West Creek Reservation in Parma, and then we found it subsequently in five water bodies. And the reason we believe that it was widespread, there are five water bodies that had it, is because 
before we identified hydrilla. We did some restoration activities where we moved pickerel weed, a native plant, from West Creek to different water bodies in the park district. So we inadvertently spread hydrilla um, in our park district. So we knew where to look first, but we look in all of the reservations and we have been surveying internally in Cleveland Metro Parks for a long time. Uh, we've managed this plant for at least nine years and uh, we believe all but one population is uh, eradicated at this point. So we were focused internally, we surveyed, we managed the plant. Ohio Department of Natural Resources helped Cleveland Metro Parks uh, fund the initial treatment of hydrilla. We, we know enough about this weed that we don't want it to spread in the region. And Cleveland Metro Parks then applied for grants to expand our hydrilla program um, to the Ohio Lake Erie watershed. That's the area outlined by the thin blue line. And anything north of that drains to Lake Erie. South is the Ohio River watershed. We've been to over 300 sites so far, um, closer to 400 at this point. Um, I don't even have the 2021 sites on this map just yet. Uh, we survey in public and private water bodies, uh, especially if you are a homeowner who suspects that they've got an invasive species and you send me a picture and we determine that it's a species of, of high concern for Ohio, that's an instance where my team and I can come out and draft up a management plan. And oops, we, we tend to survey the places that humans interact with, inflows, outflows, and I'll tell you more about our methods here. So our goal is to find these aquatic invasive plants early. We'll use boats, kayaks to survey water bodies. Most of the time we'll have a rake with us attached to a long rope. These are just two garden rakes that we've popped the heads off and clamped them together. Uh, this is our very high tech solution for retrieving plants, but actually people around the United States use this method. And even if you're doing marine algal surveys, you're looking in salt water, they still may use rake tosses. Um, and like I said, we, we look for places where people, boat launches, um, fishing locations, a boardwalk that's very popular where somebody may have dumped an aquarium. And those are the places that we'll prioritize in large water bodies. We then identify the plants that we've detected, uh, sometimes with groups. Here you can see a group of volunteers kind of going through a few different keys, learning the species identification. We complete risk assessments for species, but we don't respond to all of the aquatic invasive plants. Uh, my team is three people this year, me included. So if we were to look at Phragmites or Purple Loosestrife, a plant that is widespread in the Great Lakes area already, it would overwhelm our resources. We, we just couldn't do it. So we focus on new arrivals, outliers, um, or a leading edge of a population of aquatic invasive plants. And those are the times where my team will become involved, support others, or manage the plant ourselves. The rapid response could look like this. Here's a picture of uh, myself in the hat and um, a coworker from Pennsylvania applying herbicide at Pima Tuning Reservoir. So this herbicide bleaches the plant and over a period of time, the plant sort of starves. It can't produce its own energy anymore. So our rapid response can be chemical. It may also be physical. Here's a picture of a team at Mentor Marsh in Lake County, and we are physically removing um, European frog bit. The populations were pretty small. It's free floating. We can have a, an impact if we're yanking it by hand. Um, and then we do monitor our post treatment. So if we uh, have done some management activities, we will make sure that we follow up and continue to see if we've been effective. <laughs> I put this picture in because sometimes it shows the scale. This is the pond with hydrilla from Parma. 
they allowed us to come and we filtered all the water, pumped it dry, and then removed any piece of organic material and I vacuumed the um, pond clean. So mechanical removal in certain instances can be very effective. Um, they haven't had hydrilla since also, so it hasn't come back to date. Most invasive species presentations feature this curve. Uh, we want to catch hydrilla or any other aquatic invasive plant pretty early in that eradication area where we stand a good chance and it's less costly to try to get rid of a plant. Um, we don't want it to go on for too, too much longer. And then you can see it matures into the resource protection and management, an ongoing um, battle against an aquatic invasive plant. Okay, that is the introduction section of this presentation, and we've covered some ground. Invasive species that aquatic plants are more than just weeds. Some are very challenging, but they're important to know, so um, you don't put public water bodies at risk. Um, are there any questions so far? I've got the chat open, and I don't see any. So feel free to write in there if you have any. Do you see any, Kevin? Uh, no, it doesn't look like we have any right now. So again, uh, for all our participants, if you have any questions, feel free to type them as they come up. We can, we're happy to answer them. Um, looks like we don't have any right now. So if you want, we could go ahead and keep moving. Now we could wait a minute or so, but whatever. Yep. Whatever you nope. want to do. I'll keep it rolling. Um, if you have questions throughout, um, I'll try to keep that chat box open. So I'll um, address them as they come. And at the end, too, is a fine time. Actually, we do have a question now. So how do you oh, prevent hydrilla? Oh, um, there are a number of ways uh, to prevent the introduction of hydrilla. Um, and those are on some slides later. I would say that in our current management, we're trying to contain hydrilla from places that we know it to be. So we're doing things like installing some filters or buffers between water bodies that are infested and those downstream. And we're trying very hard to reduce the amount of vegetation. So preventing any fragments or reproducing parts of the plant. We don't want those to drift downstream or to be spread, say, by a duck that's moving from water body to water body or a boat trailer. So we're, we're trying very hard to focus on that prevention piece. There, there are other ways that you can prevent the introduction of hydrilla, um, and some of it has to do with being a, a pretty savvy consumer. It can be tricky because hydrilla looks a lot like other plants, um, but I'll get more into that in the next um, section of this talk. So good question. Um, I may not have answered it completely, but I hope that I will. Okay, we need okay. to get one more question. Uh, sure. If hydrilla is eradicated, can it come back? No. Um, Go ahead. Sorry. I had a two-parter. Sure. I'll finish. And can it continue to be costly to remove after it's already been taken out? Yeah. So um, hydrilla has some things that make it long-lived in the in a habitat. It has tubers that are sometimes buried in pretty dense sediment. We found it at least a foot into very thick clay. So those tubers can keep sprouting year after year and hydrilla can return if you don't remove that root that's pretty far down or you don't manage it over time. It can certainly reinfest a water body if you've removed it and eradicated it. So none left uh, in a water body and somebody um, or a flood washes more hydrilla into your water body, it could certainly set up shop again. Um, in the places that we know hydrilla has been, we keep our eyes on it pretty carefully. We do a lot of monitoring to make sure that we've, we've got it on the ropes and that it won't come back. Yeah, so good question. Um, that one will get a little more clarification soon too. Okay, um, thank you, those are good. I will move on to the next section and again, throw questions in the chat anytime. Um, I've got a question for you all now. How, how do aquatic invasive plants end up in our backyard ponds and wild areas? The answers that I have are that sometimes these plants are misidentified or they may be hitchhikers on desirable ornamental plants. 
Um, sometimes they're, they get contaminated by these invaders as hitchhikers. Some of these plants may be inadvertently for sale in person or online. And um, especially once hydrilla is out in the wild or in a backyard even, it may spread from one place to another through flooding, if there are migratory birds, um, if seeds are spread from one place to another. So that, those are ways that these plants may end up in our backyards and wild areas. As an example, I've got on the screen four different species of plants that I have all seen labeled as Anacris or Anacaris, um, popular plant for aquariums, but these plants can be confused by calling them all one name. Of these plants, three of them are non-native. The first two and the last one in, in order are not native to Ohio and are listed as harmful. So the only native plant is the third, Elodia, and that's native to Ohio. So for those three, hydrilla has been mixed in with plants that are for sale, like these white water lilies. Um, Ageria densa, Brazilian water weed, I have seen this plant labeled as many different types of plants um, over the years. Ageria nias, so same genus, different plant. Um, and then others just get kind of lumped in, like the far right, um, Lagar siphon major, or the African water weed. You may unintentionally get these plants if you're shopping online. Uh, a lot of plant vendors include a mystery plant or an extra plant, and they don't usually tell you what it is. So if you're getting plants from a place that has a lot of invaders, um, Florida is one example, you may inadvertently get something mixed in. And I'm always skeptical of mystery plants, especially when they look a lot like hydrilla. So I would not, that would not entice me to buy. Other times plants are for sale themselves. Frogbit is here $3.50 for European frogbit, which is causing a lot of headaches in Ohio's coastal marshes. Um, this vendor was um, contacted by the Ohio Department of Agriculture and um, I believe no longer sells this plant. So that was a good, good thing. But um, it's, this is what I mentioned about being like a savvy consumer knowing what you're buying, knowing the scientific name and knowing how to identify it may, may help save um, a backyard pond from getting an unwanted plant. We also believe that in Cleveland Metro Parks, aquarium dumps are to blame for some aquatic invasive plant introductions. We've seen Brazilian waterweed, we've seen hydrilla, um, we've also seen goldfish in these ponds too. So. If you have an aquarium with plants and animals, um, you should never release them because we believe that's one way that these invaders are escaping captivity and making it out. Um, this is a slide that shows some of the statistics and it's old, this is old data, 40 different orders. Um, Minnesota, they, um, I believe the state ordered 40 different plants and they were going after those exotic ones. They wanted to see, can we buy invasive species in our state? and they received them in 92% of their orders. And they also received plants that they didn't specifically request in 93% of their orders. 18% um, contained misidentified plants and 43% contained un unordered seeds. And maybe you remember um, back last year where there were those packets of seeds, um, I believe they, they may have in Chinese and or from China in origin, but everybody said, don't plant those seeds. We don't know where they came from. We don't know why people are getting them. Um, so apparently in Minnesota for this study, there were unordered seeds that um, could be risky to plant. They may be non-native species. Um, so one success story that I'd like to share amidst all this too, is that I was able to contact eBay and they removed hydrilla for sale in this instance from uh, a seller. So can't sell that in Ohio or the United States. It's a federally listed noxious weed. Um, another way that plants can move from upstream to downstream um, or is, 
is by water movement. And here there's upstream and downstream habitats in close proximity. So we believe that water flow moved fragments downstream. And that's how hydrilla was spread to from private water body to private water body. I'm going to zoom in from aquatic invasive plants in general and focus on three species that Ohioans should know. Um, and I want you to know that there are about 57 plants and algae on this watch list for aquatic invasive um, species in Ohio. And I'll, I'll zoom in on three of them. The first is the species that we've talked an awful lot about is hydrilla. Um, it's native to Eurasia, our strain in Ohio. Most of it, we believe, is tied to like the Korean Peninsula. The genetics works out to be that way. And you can look at this plant. Uh, one way to identify it, if you had it in your hand, is that it has serrated leaf edges. So you'd be able to see teeth on the outside of the leaf. It also produces tubers. The tubers are on the bottom right. These are um, maybe about the size of your thumbnail. They can be very far in the sediment. And just like potatoes, they have many different shoots. They can keep growing from different places and they're pretty long lived. They last a long time in, in the sediment. Most of the time, the leaves grow in groups of five. They're wrapped around the stem in a whirl. And here's an up close image of that hydrilla leaf. So you can see the teeth along the outside edge. Hydrilla grows very quickly, um, an inch a day, maybe on one stem. So many stems, a lot of plant growth. The things that make it desirable for an aquarium, that it's hard to kill, lives about anywhere, grows quickly. It's very challenging to manage that plant when it's in a wetland in a park district. Uh, I, I've said that this plant is the bracket winner. It's usually more aggressive than other aquatic plants and pushes them out. And we've been finding this plant more and more on private property. We think a contaminated, ornamental, desirable plant may have hit, hydrilla may have hitchhiked on, on water garden plants. Hydrilla can be very costly to manage. This is an out, probably an old statistic at this point, but Florida is has a lot of hydrilla and spends a lot of money to management, millions of dollars annually. North Carolina has hydrilla also. Here's a picture of a kayak that looks like they've been working very hard to get through the water, chock full of hydrilla. And here we have a parcel on Medina County Park District property that no longer looks like this, but in 2018 had a lot of hydrilla. These are the places in Ohio that hydrilla is present. So at Pima Tuning State Park, you see in Ashtabula County all the way to the upper right. The Ohio River has a lot of hydrilla. And unfortunately, we've seen it in Lancaster County um, in the past few years. We've observed it in Wayne County also, so south of Medina, and Summit had one population. The newest two, um, additions were in 2020 and they were both on private property. All the sites that we know about that are in Ohio's Lake Erie Basin, those um, are under management or uh, we can no longer find hydrilla. So we believe that we have eradicated hydrilla from any of those places with the black check mark on them. And um, we'll keep monitoring it just to make sure that the tubers don't re-sprout if there are any tubers. And hopefully we've managed it um, to eradication. Yeah, we, um, I mentioned number one. Number two, we plan to expand our surveys where we know hydrilla is. So there's private water bodies in Medina County. Medina County is the pond capital of Ohio, the most number of ponds per, per person. So um, we, we need to look in more places and more private properties too for this invasive plant. And it's, it can be time intensive to work with private landowners, um, but it is important because these private properties may be close to publicly accessible water bodies and plant fragments may move, um, seeds may move from one place to another. So it is 
it's a good idea. Um, if you've got access to a private pond and you, your water body drains into Ohio, uh, Lake Erie, um, we, our team can be the people who may even come out in person to conduct this site assessment. Okay, moving from hydrilla to um, our second species of focus that Ohioans should know. This is McGee Marsh. And I don't know if anybody's ever been up to that um, wildlife area, but near Toledo, but McGee Marsh is a great place to go bird watching. Thousands and thousands of birds annually stop over at McGee Marsh. And later in the summer, some of their canals and wetland areas may become choked up by European frog bit. It's these little lily pads that are growing in a very dense mat here. Um, actually, just this week, my aunt sent me a picture from Kelly's Island and she said, where are these cute little, little lily pads? And I said, oh, that's European frog bit. It has been seen on Kelly's Island and um, Putin Bay, South Bass, Middle Bass. It's on Pelee Island um, in Canada too. This plant, where it grows, is usually in shallow water with other plants, emergent plants. It's kind of mixed in with the cattails. Where it grows, it can be like make a very thick surface mat um, that prevents sunlight from going below it. So it shades plants below. It does produce seeds and it does produce turions, these like little leaf buds that survive the winter. Pieces of it can float. So we, we've had high lake levels in Lake Erie, on well, the Great Lakes in, in general, but these high lake levels have pushed European frog bit further inland and given it like new habitats to colonize. So there's a lot more of this plant in a lot more places uh, within the past 10 years or so. It may have purple undersides and originally it was brought to Canada um, as a botanical oddity at a research farm in Ottawa. And like so many species do, it escaped captivity. Uh, here's a picture of my hand pulling it from Metzger Marsh, again, kind of Western Lake Erie Basin. And it's a very dense map by October. The leaves are maybe only about the size of a quarter or half dollar and they're heart shaped too. I have highlighted here that it makes clonal colonies. So one plant may send out these runners and you could have one single plant occupy like 10 square feet. So it's kind of a messy network of clones moving around um, in large areas. Here are a picture of its turions. So these are like the little vegetative leaf buds that can float, and especially when they germinate and they're pretty small. So it's unknown, besides how high water levels, how exactly this plant is getting from place to place. There are good hypotheses about um, waterfowl hunters and recreationists getting these turions or the very small seeds stuck in their equipment or their decoys or their boots and moving it from one place to another. Um, that's a, a hypothesis. It's unknown exactly what role waterfowl play. Say if a duck eats a seed pod, are the seeds viable? Can it move it from place to place? Will it get stuck on duck's feathers? Um, there's a lot of research ongoing about European frog bit spread. So, um, but seeds do assist this plant in getting from place to place. Here are the places in Ohio that European frog bit has been seen. Um, it's color coded. The older counties where it was first detected in 2004 was um, Lucas County by Toledo. And then it's kind of been marching more um, eastward in the state. Last year, it was found in Mentor Marsh. The year before that, it was in Lorraine County. Um, so it's we're it, this is a species that has leading edges that we are trying to contain to prevent it from taking over new new territory. One of the ways that we manage European frog bit is by hand pulling it. So you can see some staff here on the left, Lorraine County Park District. We had a big day with volunteers. We removed the plants by hand, put them in these kiddie pools, and then 
drag them to shore um, in upland habitats that would not drain to water so they could dry out. Old Woman Creek has a very good um, European frog bit and just aquatic plant monitoring program. They've also enlisted volunteers over the years. So Cleveland Metro Parks has assisted um, most years in European frog bit removal there. So um, this can be effective at reducing the populations of plants. Um, it's hard to get every single European frog bit turion or seed that's germinating. So um, we believe both of these places still have residual populations of European frog bit. Um, there is a new website. Before I talk about Yellow Floating Heart, there is a great website, the European Frog Bit Collaborative, efbcollaborative.com, and that's like the clearinghouse for the newest research and management techniques for European frog bit. So there's hope. Although we don't have all the answers, we have a lot of good management techniques and things that people have tried um, in Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, New York, and Canada. Okay, so from European frogbit to the last of the three, this is yellow floating heart. And you can see why somebody might want this in their backyard pond. It's five showy flower petals, bright yellow, little fringed edges. Um, the lily pads themselves are maybe as big as your palm, and they look like somebody took elementary school craft scissors and cut around the outside edge. They have these scalloped, wavy edges. This plant can grow in very deep water. In the upper right-hand corner, that's like 13 feet deep at Mentor Marina Lagoons area where they dock boats. Yellow floating heart sometimes pops up in places that we don't expect it to be. It has these seeds that are specifically adapted to hitchhike, um, and they're very good at getting on duck feathers. So if a duck goes to grab something to eat and encounters one of these seeds, it flies to another water body in those little Velcro pieces really help it hitch a ride. So it pops up in places that are weird. We had a pocket in a golf course, pond, or a wetland area in Cleveland Metro Parks, Washington Park, like by the Slavic Village. And I never would have imagined the plant to be there, but it's likely brought in by, um, as a hitchhiker on waterfowl. Here are some ways to identify it. Um, Again, it's, it's rooted. This plant does root in the sediment. European frogbit is free floating. Its roots don't really anchor it to the soil unless it's very, very shallow. It has very long stems. It's scalloped leaves. And when it's in flower, it's hard to miss. Lots of people like taking photos of it. So we've had a lot of observations of it because it's so photogenic. Just like European frogbit, where it grows so thick that it overlaps and there's not sunlight that can penetrate to the plants below. Um, yellow floating heart does the same thing. Its lily pads grow, it overlaps. It prevents plants below from winning the sunlight sweepstakes. They just don't get enough sunlight and this plant may reduce biodiversity. Uh, its leaf stems and flower stems, they're also pretty thick. So this could interfere with boating and fishing and swimming. This plant overwinters as rhizomes, so it's like in the mud, it's got its root structure, and it returns year after year. Yellow floating heart has been, we had some historic records of it, like pre-1940, those counties that are in gray. And then we have some more, some recent observations. This is the most recent discoveries from 2019. So Franklin County, Columbus, had um, a few records in public and private water bodies. And then Lake County had that population that I showed you at the Mentor Marina Lagoons owned by the city. Um, Eugene Bragg, who is a great resource for the state of Ohio and aquatic ecosystems. He works with the Ohio State University's Extension Services. Eugene took this photo in 2018 of Yellow Floating Heart. I believe this is a residential pond. Multiple houses share this water body. Here's what it looks like, some in Mentor Marsh to the left and then some in the marina. So this was likely an introduced plant. Um, this was, you were able to buy this plant before 2018. 
and then it was listed as invasive in Ohio, so not to be sold or possessed in our state anymore. And it was likely brought in as an ornamental plant that escaped somebody's backyard pond near the marina and now is there. I originally did this presentation for folks from Ohio State too. So uh, instead of Michigan, it says that state up north, uh, which is Michigan does an exceptional job with their aquatic invasive species management. So um, I say that with respect in this case. Um, they had populations of yellow floating heart in pretty small ponds, and they have taken some steps to eradicate it. They have hand pulled it. Um, places in Ohio, uh, Geauga County Park District had yellow floating heart, and they used chemical methods, and they haven't seen it come back since. So you can do both. You can physically remove it, or you can treat it with herbicides. Here on the left, Michigan is hand pulling it and uh, backbreaking work, but I believe they were successful in removing yellow floating heart after subsequent efforts that may have spanned a, a couple of years. In Ohio, um, we've got plans in a small research grant to manage this plot of yellow floating heart using herbicides, um, a new herbicide to test its efficacy here in Ohio. Uh, there's our, our group out surveying. So I've, we've tackled three aquatic invasive plants specifically. We've got yellow floating heart. We just talked about European frogbit and hydrilla. Uh, the risk of these plants spreading is um, through a variety of means and methods. Um, from aquaculture, brick and mortar stores, to online sales and mystery plants, um, to seeds that may hitchhike on waterfowl or may be tracked on boots or equipment from one place to another. Masks, snorkels, they may be vectors of spread. If you've seen boat trailers or boats with bilges, live wells, um, there are lots of nooks and crannies on a boat trailer and on a boat that plants can stay wet and move from one place to another. So it's very important to clean, drain, and dry your equipment, your trailers, your boat, ropes and anchors too. These are ways that humans assist these plants in spreading around. And if you're doing things that prevent aquatic invasive animals like zebra mussels, spiny water flea, uh, round goby, if you're preventing those from moving from place to place, um, you're probably also preventing the spread of aquatic invasive plants. StopAquaticHitchhikers.org is great. The Ohio State University Seed Grant so their extension services and Stone Lab, they do a, a great job at prevention resources. So just ask me and I'll send you a, a lot of resources around um, prevention uh, and what you can do besides cleaning, draining, drying your equipment. And these are great things to, to do too. I've got some tips for water gardeners. Um, if you are acquiring plants for your backyard pond, Make sure you check the scientific names, know what you're buying. You can quarantine plants before you introduce them. There may be snails, unwanted plants, or seeds on, on them. So if you're able to set those aside before you introduce them to your backyard pond, it may save you and our natural areas a headache. Um, you can call garden centers and ask them if they've ever had trouble with hydrilla, Eurasian water milk foil. Um, they've generally been pretty forthcoming, and if they put effort into removing invasive species from their growing greenhouses, um, sometimes they like to tell you and, and brag about it too. So I've had some success there and look for native plants when you can. Uh, I wanted to tell you the steps. I, I want you to have some interaction with this project. There are steps that we usually take when we're working with a private landowner. The first is that we make contact. So you know we exist, you know that we're grant funded to look for aquatic invasive plants. Um, I may ask private landowners to send me a picture if they suspect they've got hydrilla, yellow floating heart, or a nuisance plant. Usually we can identify it with an email or a photo through text. Um, we get permission to survey water bodies from private landowners. Uh, we have a, a form, like a, a liability form that we we ask to be signed and we go back and forth with. 
And then our crew can come out to a site and survey independently, or we like having an audience too, we'll teach you about aquatic invasive plants. Um, and this goes for public landowners too, if you're a park district or um, a wildlife agency that we haven't contacted yet, um, feel free to reach out. At the end of our surveys, we'll create a report of the species we find and we'll highlight any invaders that are present. If we do find a species that is of high concern, like hydrilla, we will conduct a risk assessment and create a management proposal. Here's what we think you should do to stop this plant from spreading because we don't want it in the Great Lakes area. It might include herbicides, it might include physical management, um, again, mechanical too, or We'll tell you what happens if you do nothing. What's the risk to our public and private water resources? And so far to date, we've been successful at um, covering these management costs using grant funds. So um, a lot of thanks to the generosity of the grant funders. Yeah, so uh, I wanna just make a note real quick that prevention is really one of the most important facets of this project. There are a lot of great experts in Ohio and we need more eyeballs in the field, more hydrilla hunters on the lookout, more people looking and aware of what these aquatic plants are. So here are ways you can get involved. You can share your observations with the United States like national databases. Um, USGS, the Geological Service, has a really great one, non-indigenous aquatic species database. Ed Maps, Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System, and the Great Lakes Early Detection Network are places that publish nationally. We also conduct a project on iNaturalist that grabs observations and shows them to us so we can see if other people are seeing these nuisance aquatic plants. Another way to get involved is you can schedule a site survey with Cleveland Metro Parks through October 1st is really our field season. And you're welcome to email me anytime if you've got suspicious plants. Take a photo, close up of the plant, one of the habitat, and usually we can get it to a, a, an identification virtually. The role of Cleveland Metro Parks is to survey for and respond to aquatic invasive plants in the Lake Erie watershed, the area that's blue. We do detection and we spread decontamination resources. So we put together kits for our partners, especially if they're another um, public agency, we'll help them give them guidebooks give them stuff to clean their equipment, tell them what to be on the lookout for. And if you're in Ohio's river watershed, um, we can't come and survey, but we can connect you with other resources. Um, the Ohio Invasive Plants Council, Sea Grant, Division of Wildlife, the Department of Agriculture, and then watershed groups are great. Soil and water conservation districts are also very good. So we've got pretty good connections with local watershed and um, other folks who can help out with nuisance aquatic plants, even if it's outside of our jurisdiction. Uh, the project is set to continue in 2022. Um, and thanks to ODNR and U.S. Fish and Wildlife for funding the project. This is one of my favorite scenes from Lord of the Rings where Frodo splashes into a lake. This is not how we look for plants, but um, Sometimes it does feel like you're just staring into it. My three big points are that these plants are more than just weeds, and it's important that we know a little bit about them so we can identify those plants that may threaten our healthy, weed-free aquatic ecosystems. We should be on the lookout for certain plants, and you may just find some really cool rare plants along the way too. Um, shop for scientific names for plants, go native when you can, and if you, um, are so inclined or suspect that you have, especially if you suspect you have aquatic invasive plants, um, give a holler. We are scheduling surveys through like October 1st, September 30th. We have a lot of resources. Um, if people are interested, I'll send these out later and it's recorded. You can pause this page too. Um, here's my email address. If you've got questions, um, I've hopefully got answers. I know I talked about rare and notable plant discoveries in the past few years, so if I don't see many questions, I will get to those, but I want to leave some time for questions before 7 o'clock gets here. So I'll open the chat, and Kevin, if you see any too. Sure, sure. Yeah, we do have a few questions. Let's, uh, let's get right into the, um, our, 
invasive species illegal to sell? Um, and yeah. the answer is no. How yeah. can um, yeah, there are federally regulated species, and then states also have lists. Um, if it's federally regulated, like hydrilla, unlawful to sell, possess, um, distribute in all of the U.S. Some plants are, you may be able to buy them in Ohio, like water lettuce, but Minnesota, you're not able to sell them. So if you look on aquatic plant vendors' websites, they may say, cannot sell to Ohio, Michigan, Indiana. Um, there's there's more uniformity, but um, coming down the pipeline, but it's still some states have different regulations. Awesome. Okay. Um, we have a few more questions. How should one dispose of invasive aquarium plants? Oh yeah, for the plants for sure. I would just make sure that they are completely dried out. Um, you could set them on the concrete driveway, let them dry out, and um, Maybe that's not so good if they have seeds. So I would dewater them, wrap them in paper towel, put them in a plastic bag and put them in the landfill trash. That's probably the safest way. Sometimes in the field, if we know a certain plant will not, doesn't have any reproductive structures, we'll put it far away from any water source. It won't be able to come back to the water and we'll leave it in like a compost pile to dry out. But if it's just an aquarium plant, I would drain the water from it, wrap it in paper towels, and um, send it to a landfill. Okay, if a private pond has had drill, what is the best way to remove it? Oh, yeah, that depends. Um, if it's a small water body that has a liner, uh, we have had success draining and removing plants physically. Hydrilla, again, it's, it's tricky. Its tubers really do grow very deeply in the soil. So for most of the ponds in Ohio and in Cleveland Metro Parks, our management technique has been to use herbicide. It's a product called fluoridone. It's systemic. And anytime the plant is growing in the water and it absorbs this herbicide, uh, it will prevent the plant from going through photosynthesis and eventually the plant tissue will die. If you keep doing that over a period of sometimes as many as seven to 10 years, and sometimes as few as three or four or two even, um, you exhaust the tuber bank. If there are no tubers that can grow from the sediment, um, chances are you've gotten rid of the hydrilla that will regrow. So it's kind of like a marathon race. You put herbicide in the water, you keep herbicide in the water all through the growing season, and then you monitor to see how many tubers are left in the soil at the end of one year. Uh, each year, you should expect about an 85% reduction in hydrilla tubers. So you see pretty good success. You don't have vegetation after the first year, usually. And um, it, it can go away with careful monitoring and treatment, but it's, it's a hard plant to get rid of, which is why I think the Great Lakes region is so invested in preventing it from spreading because we know it's, it's a menace when it's on the loose. So um, I hope that answers your question. If you think you've got hydrilla, um, I'll be happy to send some of our management proposals um, for ways to deal with it. Thank you. Um, okay. So how do herbicides affect the ecosystem when used? Do they pollute water? It's a great segue from your last answer. Yeah, it um it depends. Uh some of the compounds are like a scorched earth. Let me get rid of this vegetation because I'm afraid that it is going to contaminate a vital um public water resource in Ohio. Those can be things like um contact herbicides, some of which are copper compounds that um, are harmful to plants on contact and may also harm other wildlife, um, fish and amphibians. Um, there are great data sheets, great labels if you're applying in the label rate um, and you're managing these plants in the way that's recommended. Chances are you will have fewer non-target impacts, so you'll target that plant and hopefully just get that plant. There are other herbicides that are very plant specific. Um, the one that we use for hydrilla 
and for some other plants has it's like broad and systemic. We apply it at six parts per billion, so pretty low concentration. It is enough to knock out some other plants, like at North Chagrin, we have knocked out our lily pads, um, and everybody asks when they will come back, and the answer is when we stop managing for hydrilla. Um, we may reintroduce lily pads that we know are clean. Um, and there's a new herbicide that has a very low time in the water and uh, a very selective approach to certain plants. So there, there are quite a few options um, and they run the gambit from contact herbicide to um, longer acting systemic herbicides. Um, we've got some pretty good data about what plants have survived our treatment of hydrilla and it's quite a few. Um, we've noticed not too many plants have been removed from our hydrilla management. Um, and it's a balance. We, I would say that Cleveland Metro Parks, all options are always on the table for these plant management activities. Um, but herbicides are a very valuable tool in the tool belt because some of the alternative managements for plants may include dredging, draining, um, some very heavy handed and um, risky activities if you're trying to prevent fragments of plants from moving from place to place. So, um, there are certifications to get for pesticide licensure in Ohio. And um, when people are following the label rates and treating a pond appropriately, um, usually things go pretty well for invasive species management. And we've been happy in the park district and with our partner properties um, managing using herbicides. But that, that question about the non-target impacts really depends on the herbicide. Um, and I'd be happy to answer specific questions um, off off camera too. Okay, so say so, uh, we have two more questions. I'll put them both together, They're kind of similar, and then yeah, should, we should be all set on the questions. Um, Great. Okay. Are there aquatic plants that you could recommend to use along stream banks to help erosion? And is there any places in particular that you could purchase native aquatic plants? Yeah, those are great questions. So I like to refer people to the Lake Erie Allegheny Partnership for Biodiversity for um, different native plants. Um, the Cleveland Metro Parks also has a native plant guide online that features a lot of emergent plants. Um, so yes, I can make that list available or send it out as a follow-up to registrants of this program, maybe with Kevin's help. Um, Native aquarium plants um, becomes a little more challenging. Uh, we also have some species lists for that. But um, yeah, I would say for a good holistic list, um, I would need to follow up after this presentation with um, emergent plants that are good for riparian buffer zones, and then our other list for what might be recommended for a backyard pond and water garden. If you want to send me that list, I'm happy to send it out to everyone. I could put it on our website next to the link for the video. I could point it, point you guys to that. So, good. Thanks. Um, I'll be in touch with that, Kevin. Great. Sounds good. Okay. Looks like that's the last of the questions. So, if you want to continue, feel free. Okay. Great. I know it's seven o'clock, but this is the most exciting part: uh, recent discoveries of native rare plants. This is Potamogeton basii, um, basies pondweed. It's kind of like a spring ephemeral. So it's there in the spring, but goes away uh, in the summer and fall. We found it in Lorain County Park District. I was part of the team of folks who discovered this one and it hadn't been seen in Ohio since 19, or 18, 1935. So a long time since they have found this plant. And I really think that because it kind of loses its floating leaves, and blends in with other plants, it's hard to identify. And I also think people weren't just, are not looking for aquatic plants. And that was maybe why we were lucky in discovering and rediscovering this plant in Ohio. Another plant, and this one was growing in Lake Erie, is fine leaf pondweed. And it looks very similar to another plant. Uh, this plant, I really think is widespread. This was last seen in the 1970s, I believe. Um, I think it's a tricky identification. You can see it next to um, 
hold it up, holding it up to a common plant in the same genus. If you zoom in on the leaf tips, one is blunt, the other comes to a point, it's acute. Uh, there are a few more differences, but we were very excited to find this plant. Um, again, it was growing in the Lake Erie Harbor, so a good sign that water quality and um, diversity is pretty good in, in Lake Erie and on the mend and rebound. So a cool plant discovery. This one was a great plant find. Uh, it was, I believe, on a BioBlitz by Portage and maybe Geauga County. Um, this is this one. This plant had like a hundred dollar reward for finding it. Somebody at Cleveland Museum of Natural History said, "I know this plant is in Ohio, um, and I hope somebody rediscovers it." So this had again been a very long time since anybody had seen it. Oops. So Biden's Becky Eye, water marigold, very pretty, um, not common in Ohio, but it was a good find. Um, there are, those are the aquatic plants that made the list for best rare finds between 2019 and 2020. There's good, I have it on good intel that there should be a couple of more rare and exciting plant rediscoveries in Ohio this year. So people are out there and looking and with a guidebook and some time in a water body, you may also stumble upon one of these very rare plants. There are many more out there that people haven't seen in a long time. So I think it's kind of exciting. We manage invasive plants, but we also need to know what's native so we, we can tell them apart from the invaders. So yeah, that, um, that is the end of my slideshow.